So it's been just over a week since I got my shiny new PlayStation 5, and I've been playing with the system pretty much non-stop over that time, so I thought it would be appropriate to sit down in front of a microphone and give my thoughts and overall impressions on the console as a whole and some of the games that I've been playing. In case you're wondering, no, I didn't have to sell my soul to the devil or beat down a grandma in a Walmart parking lot. I actually got very lucky when it came to ordering the system. Back when they became available for pre-order in September, I think, I just went to Amazon and clicked Add to Cart and that was it. It was done. The first thing you notice when you see this thing in person is that it's a big boy. It's huge. It dwarfs pretty much everything else in my entertainment center. It's also pretty clear that, visually speaking, it was designed to be the most aesthetically pleasing when stood vertically, which is how they announced it and how it's been shown off in all of their advertising. But most people, I'd be willing to bet, are going to put a console sideways in their entertainment center, and when you do that, it kind of looks like a clam with its giant tongue sticking out. It's not bad. But it does look odd among all the other, you know, right-angle black systems that are around it. But let's talk about the PS5 once you've actually booted it up. In my opinion, the UI that is presented here is very clean and sleek. It doesn't take too long to figure out where everything is and how to get to where you're going. I do feel like there are points where things take maybe a button press or two too many, and I'm so used to holding down the PlayStation button to bring up the turn off controller and turn off system menu that I keep doing that out of reflex, but now they've actually flipped it. So now you're just tapping the button to bring up a sub menu to get to that stuff and holding it down brings you to the home screen. It's something I'll get used to in time, but still, even after a week, I am constantly bringing up the wrong menus out of reflex. So far, the biggest standout features and conveniences of the system are its loading times. I'm sure you've heard plenty of people talk about how impressive they are, but there's a reason for that. They really are some of the quickest loading times I've ever experienced. For example, Spider-Man Miles Morales from the PlayStation Home menu to playing the game takes about 15 seconds, and Demon's Souls takes about 20 seconds, and that could actually be shorter if they didn't force you to watch a, a cutscene first before bringing you to the main menu. Another really neat feature is that once you've loaded a game and you see all the logos and splash screens, you don't see them again. It just skips all of that, skips all the company logos, and brings you right to the game menu. At least sometimes it does. This has actually been somewhat inconsistent for me. I'd say most of the time the logos don't show up again, but sometimes they do, and I'm really not sure what's causing them to load up again. At first, I thought it was maybe a feature only present in rest mode, which I'll get to in a bit. But I've had logos reappear even when the system was in rest mode. I've had them not appear after a complete full shutdown and reboot. Uh, some games like the Pathless, the logos show up all the time, no matter what. So it's kind of all over the place. More often than not, games will skip their opening logos and splash screens. But the times when it doesn't skip them really stand out. Now, all of that is possible because of the new internal SSD that the PS5 uses. And while that's great, the amount of storage space that is available in a base PS5 is not enough. On a completely new system, you have about 660 some odd gigs to work with, which is enough for a few games. Uh, games like Spider-Man were 50 some odd gigs, Demon Souls I also think was around there. But for some games like Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, which are 200 gigs, you're going to run out of hard drive space really quick, especially if you're also going to be downloading your backlog from the PlayStation 4. Now, there is an option to expand your storage space using uh, third-party hard drives, but the problem is that right now, at launch, you cannot install PlayStation 5 games on any drive other than the internal SSD. And brand new next-gen PS5 games are going to be the biggest. They're going to take up the most space, so hopefully that's an update down the line where they let you play them off of anything. I can understand if they limit it so that you can only play PS5 games off of an SSD. Just don't limit it to the one and only SSD that's already in the system. 
Side note, I highly recommend going into your system settings and turning off the automatic capture video for trophies option. It never shows anything good. It's always some random out of context 15 second clip. So just stop that, save yourself the space because if you leave that on and you plan on going for a lot of trophies, that's going to eat into your limited hard drive space. So, rest mode. This is a standard feature that was introduced last generation and it carries over to this one. And um, yeah, don't use it. Um, there have been widespread reports of people uh, having various problems when it came to booting a game from rest mode or resuming a game. Some people apparently have had their consoles be bricked, uh, other people have just had crashes. Now in my experience, I had uh, two crashes while playing Spider-Man Miles Morales, uh, pretty much back to back within five minutes of each other. Though to be fair, those were at the like very end of my New Game Plus playthrough when I was trying to get the Platinum. So it didn't really get in the way, it was just annoying. The other problem I ran into is while playing Astro's Playroom, a few items didn't have the correct textures. I think one was all green and another one was glowing radioactive white, which I just chalked up to like a weird, a weird bug or something. And then when I went through a loading screen, this happened. Now, thankfully, this was resolved with a simple game restart, and I can't say for sure that rest mode is what caused these. I'm just using that as a scapegoat because it's the only thing I'm really seeing that is causing problems for people, and I was using rest mode when these happened to me. So, just as a precaution, now whenever I stop playing, I fully power down my system, and I would recommend you doing the same until some kind of patch comes out and Sony acknowledges that these particular issues aren't happening anymore. If you are using rest mode to like charge your controller while you're not play, you can do that still, but once you are ready to play and you turn on your system again, do a full reboot anyway just in case. Speaking of that controller, the DualSense is really well built, it's got a great amount of heft to it, and the features that it offers are potentially gimmicky, but are really cool if developers choose to take advantage of them in the future. The haptic feedback, which is basically variable rumble, uh, it's rumble that changes its intensity and where it is in the controller depending on what you're doing, is really neat. The fact that you can physically feel every footstep in certain games, uh, you can feel the difference whether you're swimming in water, walking on sand, walking on metal. When a character rolls, the vibration will start at the front of the controller and move forward to simulate the action. The vibrations in different parts of the controller get more or less intense depending on what's happening in the environment. It's, it's a really neat feature, though I will admit that it's kind of one of those things that you only really appreciate it if you're actively paying attention. Uh, for most people, I would imagine after the first couple days with the system, it just kind of turns back into rumble, and you'll only appreciate it if you stop concentrating on the game and actually think, I wonder what the controller is doing right now. The thing I think is actually way cooler, and the thing that you notice way more, are the adaptive triggers. Uh, these things will change their resistance depending on what you're doing. So if you're pulling back a slingshot or uh, compressing a spring to jump, you will feel it fighting back against you. You can feel the resistance. And the fact that it seamlessly, moment to moment, changes to being a normal trigger, to having a little resistance, to being really, really strenuous, it's really cool and something that you actively notice all of the time, as opposed to the rumble. There's also the return of the touchpad, uh, there's a microphone you can blow into, and there's a motion sensing in the controller itself, so you can shake it around. These I could sort of take or leave, they're kind of gimmicky in my opinion, and uh, they were also present in the PS4, so nothing all that revolutionary there. Thankfully, with all of these different features, the motion sensing, the haptic feedback, the adaptive triggers, the battery life is way, way better than a PS4 controller. I think that thing would usually last somewhere around five hours, but in my experience, the DualSense has lasted 10 to 12 on average, which is great. You can sit down and game for a whole day and not even have to worry about it. Now let's shift gears and talk about specific games that I've been playing. The first of which is Astro's Playroom. Now this comes free with every PlayStation 5 system, and its main goal is to show off the capabilities of the DualSense controller, and I think it does a great job at doing that. 
but thankfully it's also a pretty fun little platformer that stands on its own. This thing is pretty much a love letter to the history of PlayStation. All of the collectibles that you're finding are accessories or portable consoles, and at the end of every world you unlock and a PlayStation, you find the PlayStation 1 or 2 or 3, and seeing all the love and detail and references everywhere, it's hard not to have a dumb little smile on your face when you see these little robots dressed up as Dante from Devil May Cry, or have this nostalgic wave wash over you when you complete a level and are greeted with multiple screens doing the original PlayStation 1 boot up. It's, it's really cool. Without a doubt, Astro's Playroom makes the best use of the controller's features, because that's its primary goal, is to show them off to you. Uh, now, this does result in stuff feeling gimmicky, like there's a, a ball that you move around using the touchpad. There are also a lot of times where they have you steer your character using the tilting of the controller, and it works, yeah, but it's not going to feel as good as just using sticks, and in my opinion, I think a lot of these more gimmicky sections overstay their welcome. They go on just a little too long. That stuff aside, though, the game itself at its core is a fun, simple little platformer with tons of charm. It looks really nice, and if you have any experience with the PlayStation brand, you are going to have a great time going down memory lane. I highly recommend that no matter what you're looking forward to playing on this system, no matter what high-profile AAA games you have ready to go, play Astro's Playroom first, because it'll make you really appreciate the various controller features that other games might not utilize as well. Next up is Spider-Man Miles Morales. Now, if you played and enjoyed the Spider-Man game from a couple years ago on PlayStation 4, then check it out. You're also going to like this one because it is a very similar experience in most ways. The swinging controls just as great as it did before, and the combat and stealth remain enjoyable, if a bit button mashy at times. But all of that is given new life and feels a bit refreshing again because you are playing as a different character, Miles. His animations, uh, his moves during combat, his abilities are all different. It really is that exaggerated Great swagger of a black, black teen that makes him stand out. Jesus Christ, GameSpot, why? <laughs> When you were swinging around as Peter, it felt like there was a confidence there, there was an experience, but Miles, his swinging is more freeform and kind of fun-loving, because he's still getting used to this whole superhero thing. The main thing that really makes Miles feel different in combat, though, are his uh, electricity powers. The last game, the combat was built around that pretty standard Arkham formula of beat on guys, build up a combo, do finishers, rinse and repeat. With Miles, that's still there, but you're also building up a meter that lets you do a Venom Strike, or launch all the enemies into the air. These abilities are actually pretty overpowered, but that's what makes them fun. You are just decimating entire rooms full of bad guys in like a couple of moves because he's just blasting them with an Electro Punch, and that, that can't help but be fun. The one big downside, I think, to Miles Morales is that it's noticeably shorter than the last game, which I'm not inherently against on its own, because I personally like it when games are tighter and more put together as opposed to something that's bloated and lasts way longer than it has any right to. But in the case of Miles, this causes its story and characters to feel pretty rushed. They're just not given enough time to breathe, so everything that happens is pretty predictable and doesn't have the weight that I feel it should. To be fair, the game sort of acknowledges this up front, given its price tag. It's selling for only $50 as opposed to $60 or $70. Though, man, it's really weird that $50 is considered discount nowadays. But even so, I just I wish all of these characters had more time to really to really grow. Because as it is, they're fine, they're likable, you'll remember them, but they don't really elevate themselves either. I don't know if this is the greatest metric to judge things by, but to give you an idea of how quick the campaign moves, on a New Game Plus playthrough, with the difficulty knocked down to easy, and skipping whatever cutscenes the game let me, although it actually doesn't let you skip most of them, I got through the game a second time in about two and a half hours. Take that how you will. Even with those complaints, though, it's still a whole lot of fun to be Spider-Man, and if you go out of your way to find all of the collectibles, you're still looking at about 12 to 15 hours of content, depending on how efficient you are. 
And if you decide to go the extra mile and get the platinum like I did, which is an easy platinum if you're interested, you're looking at like 18 to 20 hours. Moving on to the second game I platinumed this week. Yeah, this surprised me too. Bug Snacks is that game that kind of horrified everyone uh, when it got announced months back. It's that game where furry creatures eat sentient food and then their limbs turn into the food. Yeah, that's a nightmare fuel premise. And even knowing it was coming, still nightmare fuel premise. But once you get over that horrific weirdness and just accept it as part of the world, this game is better than a game called Bug Snacks has any right to be. I think the most surprising thing is that the actual characters that you run into and their writing and their voice acting are actually pretty good. You'll grow to like these guys and want to help them out, even if helping them out transforms their head into a pineapple or their body into a hot dog, but throwing that aside, they have more than enough personality that you actively want to help them, not just for trophy completion. By the time the credits rolled, I was actually pretty impressed with what Bug Snacks had to offer. Now, the gameplay loop revolves around discovering and capturing the Bug Snacks. There are 100 in total to find and grab, and doing that is enjoyable, although as the game goes on and you repeat the process of catching them over and over and over again, it does start to feel repetitive, especially if you're a completionist going for everything. This is because despite having a decent number of tools at your disposal to help you capture the bug snacks, in reality, there's only like four different ways that you grab them. You either throw them in a cage, you trip them up, you lead them to a place. That's pretty much it. And once you realize that the whole puzzle element of figuring out how to capture them sort of goes by the wayside. This is another game that is easy to platinum. Uh, I'd say it takes probably 13 hours in total to do that if you are interested in trophy hunting. And the game itself is, is worth it, I think. It's $25 or free with PlayStation Plus. I got it for free. I know this game is a giant meme and everyone's just been poking fun at it, me included, but if you actually judge it on its own merits, you'll have a good time with it, and I actually recommend it. Demon Souls. This Demon Souls is a remake of the game of the same name that came out on PS3 many years back. It was actually the original Souls game that started it all, and hey, check it out, it's still great. It's also a game that will kick your ass if you're not paying attention, but that's what these games are, so if you're interested in that, you're gonna love this. I actually beat the original Demon Souls when it came out on PS3, but I haven't touched it in years, so going back to this, it's it's been really fun to both have my memories come flooding back to me where I recognize things and also forget certain pitfalls and walk right into the same deadly traps that probably killed me like over a decade ago. This is, in my opinion, the best looking launch game on the PS5. It's absolutely gorgeous. The vistas and the environments are stunning. They're full of detail. And with everything running at 60 frames a second, everything feels really smooth and the gameplay is just snappier as a result. So good. If you're a purist who's worried that they might have tainted the spirit of the original with this remake, then you can rest easy. They did not. This is more or less a one-to-one -one recreation of the original Demon Souls, down to the environment layouts, the enemies. This also means that some of the quirks of the original are still present here. Like, for example, sometimes the hitboxes feel a little off. You'll get hit by something when you feel like you shouldn't have. And that wonderful sweet spot for where exactly you can backstab someone also seems kind of inconsistent, but that's how it was back in the day. And if you're a purist, you're going to be happy that they left everything more or less the same. There are also some really good quality of life improvements added. I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge or memory of the original, so I can't tell you for sure all of them. But some of the bigger ones that stood out to me were the ability to send items in the world to your storage if you don't have the room to carry them. And from the art stones, you can teleport directly to the different checkpoints in the world you're in instead of having to go back to the Nexus first and then teleport back. 
If you've played the original back in the day, the visual overhaul and the little changes here and there are more than enough to breathe new life back into the game, so you'll have a great time revisiting it. And if you've never played Demon Souls and you're ready to get your ass kicked, then I highly recommend it. This is the best launch game that is available on the system, and I think one of the only true exclusives that the PS5 has. The last game I spent any real significant time with this week was The Pathless. Now, I'll be honest here, for the first hour I was playing this, it really wasn't grabbing me, although that was also at the end of a 7-hour PS5 launch stream, so that's not exactly fair. But I've played some more of it, and I'm starting to enjoy it more, though it's still not my favorite game of what I've played this week. The game is beautiful, no doubt. It has a very striking, bright visual style. Everything has a lot of color to it. When you're soaring through the air and, and taking in the environment around you, it is undeniably gorgeous. The calm music that's present while you're exploring around, and the really pumping music that's happening during chase scenes or a boss fight, those are all also great. It really is the gameplay loop that took a while to grab me, because it is a pretty laid-back, exploration-based game. You're basically dashing around the environment while continuously shooting all of these floating talismans that are placed everywhere in order to keep your stamina gauge, I guess, going. And when you're on the move and you've got a really good combo going, and you're just constantly shooting talismans and getting bursts of speed, it can feel really good to zip across the environment. The fault lies in when things really slow down. There are uh, these little puzzles you have to solve in order to unlock uh, glyphs that you can use to purify towers to progress, and all of these puzzles have been very simple and falling into the same pattern of moving a mirror or shooting an arrow through fire, and it hasn't really changed. Granted, I haven't finished the game yet, so maybe it does, but so far my impression is that Eh, when these puzzles show up, I'm not really challenged, I'm just sort of doing them as a means to an end. There are also these times where the game forces you into stealth, where, like, a corrupted creature is roaming the land, and it's looking around, and whenever it's looking at you, you just have to stop moving. But it's very binary, basic start-and-stop stealth, and it just slows down the pacing. It's kind of neat because of how visually striking these sections are with all the red, but after the first time you do it, any time you do it afterwards just feels like they're wasting your time. I really have to spend more time with the Pathless to really form a full concrete opinion on it, but so far, whenever I'm on the move, I'm enjoying myself, and whenever the game asks me to stop and do something else, it's kind of not bad, but it's not, it's not really all that engaging to me either. So overall, what do I think of the PlayStation 5 after a week of messing with it? Do I think it's worth going through all of the hassle of trying to get one right now? Well, no. I, I think it's a very solid system with a lot of really good convenience features like the loading times, the logos being skipped, but it also has its quirks like the rest mode issue that needs to get patched and the very limited storage space. And on top of that, when it comes to the games, I've had fun with all of them, but I'm also not going to point at one and say, oh my god, your life is going to change if, if you don't play this right now, go find a PS5. If you're lucky enough to find a PS5 in the wild and manage to hook it up and play it yourself, I think you'll be impressed by some of the features that it offers, but it's also not some revolutionary, mind-blowing system either. At least, in my opinion, it's not. If you're able to find one, good on you, you'll enjoy your time with it, but if you can't, don't stress, there's still plenty of great games to play, and if you can't find one until a year from now or two years from now, then that just means you'll have an extended backlog of great games to play then. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my incoherent ramblings about the PS5. Let me know if you were lucky enough to find one at launch yourself, and if you were, please let me know what that experience was like, and let me know your thoughts on the system. Consider leaving a rating on the video if you enjoyed the sound of my voice, subscribe to the Critical Nobody channel for more content, and always remember that Bugsnax is the game of the year and no one can tell me otherwise.